This week, we're joined by Don Pizzette and Tim Broom from ITPro.tv. In our startup articles and discussion, the key to growth, startup on the right foot, think until it hurts, startup financial modeling, and marketing automation and problem solving should guide your business strategy. We're then going to talk about Bain Capital, Tanium, Microsoft, and more. All that on this episode of Startup Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show about security startups, how to secure your startup, and advice for security startups, it's Startup Security Weekly. I need it from the top. Brought to you by, do you have a website, an external presence, employees, an office? Any of these things can be compromised and attacked. How are you defending these assets? Have you penetration tested these public assets? Start 2017 by taking a proactive approach to securing your vulnerable areas. Black Hills Information Security has been helping companies find their weaknesses since 2008. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com and see how they can help you sleep better at night. Welcome, everyone, to Startup Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, and this is, in fact, May 26th, 2017. It's Friday before Memorial Day, and we're doing episode 41 of Startup Security Weekly. I am joined on the lines via Skype by, and this is a long time coming. He's not going to be the beach bum anymore. We've said this for a couple of weeks now. We're going to see you in some new digs. How soon, Michael, you think? You know, it's it's funny you, you uh, mentioned that. We were just assessing it as a family uh, in the last week. What I'll say is current plan looks like now by end of year. Gotcha. Original thought was l- lay out the summer in Myrtle Beach and then uh, make that transition and try to break it with school year. But then, you know, look, I'll tell you straight up, looking at it from a startup perspective, we said, okay, what do we need as a family? What do we need as a business? What would make us feel good stability-wise to make the move easier? And uh, we kind of looked at it and said, well, so we're going to reassess in August, and that'll give us a timetable, but looks so like... So what you're saying is you wanted to spend your summer at the beach. I mean, that's really what you're saying. Yeah, it's kind of worked out that way. <laughs> Funny how that works well, out that way. Well, and I'll tell you what else factored into it, though, when you ask about it, because, so the thing is, we're not we're not leaving Myrtle Beach because we don't like it. We're, we're leaving Myrtle Beach because uh, this was a great place to come. We uh, we expanded our family. We I came here to try to figure out some of the stuff that we do as a business, and man, if we've been hitting the accelerator switch lately. So it was like, okay... So the, the, my, our older two kids are getting to that high school age. So it was, okay, yeah. where do we want to go? And we're looking bigger city. And as it gets closer, we'll share with people where that's going to be. But there's a couple cities we're, we're evaluating right now. But then it was, okay, well, wait a minute. So, yeah, to your point, if we wait out the summer here, then we're going to try to move in September. Well, hold on. That's busy time for, for us business-wise. Yeah. Okay. So, which, gosh. So then, it, so it starts looking like, well, so do you move over, th- over Thanksgiving? Do you move over the holiday break? And that's kind of what we're starting to look at now. Like, where where would it fit timing-wise? It makes sense for us. And then, frankly, the rest of it was delaying it by even a couple months. We decided, and we sat down with our children and asked them, didn't, didn't detriment them in any way, but gives us a lot more confidence, a lot more strength, a lot more stability, and I went, well, then that's a good plan. Let's do that. So, I like I like how you looked at it as like a startup decision. That's that's how it was. Yeah, that's I mean, awesome. to be fair, we straight talked it. Yeah, <laughs> we, awesome. we did the, we'll probably try to solve it. <laughs> we off it. So, you know. That's great. Um, a yeah. couple of quick announcements before we get started. Uh, I'm going to speed up my, my teleprompter here. I was un, unprepared for that. Of course, IT Pro TV's courses now include Apple Certified Support Professional, CompTIA Security Plus, and ITIL Planning Protection and Optimization. Premium annual memberships include all video content as well as access to virtual labs and Q&A forums. If you don't watch or listen to Security Weekly, you'd pay $85.70 a month or $857 per year. But we have a special offer for a limited time. Get 30% off a monthly membership for for the lifetime of your active subscription using the code SS30. And I say that so well now that I know that Tim and Don are going to change it out on me. <laughs> that it's going to be a whole other learning process because I can like nail it now and I know that it's going to change, which is fine. 
I have to get better. Uh, the Sands Pen Test Hackfest Summit call for presentations uh, is closing today. Uh, this is something you want to pay attention to. If you're listening to this live, uh, 5 p.m. is the deadline for the CFP for that conference hosted by a renowned instructor and hacker Ed Scotus. Um, pen test CFP at sands.org with the subject line Sands Pen Test Hackfest Summit CFP 2017. If you haven't done so already, uh, submit your CFP. This is the, the final moments of CFP. Um, our special guests today are Don Pizzette and Tim Broom from itpro.tv. Don and Tim, welcome to the show. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. It's wonderful. Yeah, uh, yeah it's nice to have uh, both of you here on the show today. And it's interesting. I don't think we've ever had the, the conversation of like, what's your story? Like, how did you guys meet? How did you guys decide you wanted to start a company? What was the vision? How did you guys get started? Well, I think it, it started with... Uh, I was in a, a career of transportation, and after relocating about five times, my wife no longer wanted to move, and she said, uh, you always watch this guy on TV a lot, on tech TV, Leo Laporte, why don't you do something with computers? So I said, all right, you're smart, let's go ahead and do something with computers. <laughs> so the first thing I did is I uh, started to get my NT4 certification, so I started taking classes in A+, and CompTIA, and Microsoft, and uh, then fell into, you know, maybe I want to... I'm going to start up a learning center. I wanted to create that in, here in Gainesville, and it had the opportunity. So kind of headed down that path and got open. And then Don walked in my door about two weeks after we opened, and uh, we kind of struck up a friendship and a relationship. So he was smart, smarter than me, and he could teach. I can't teach. So uh, Don started teaching courses for us, and for 15 years, we had a brick-and-mortar uh, computer learning center, training center, doing uh, career training and enterprise corporate training on the authorized training world, on the Microsoft, on the Cisco and security areas. Uh, as that business kind of turned to evolve away uh, from the what would be the traditional classroom, we saw the writing on the wall and wanted to do some stuff online. And because of some things that we had done previously in video, had an interest to do some video and maybe some the online streaming component. So we worked... Uh, we were either naive or, or had too much ego and said, we'll just create our own stuff. And we persevered and kind of worked through it. And IT Pro TV was born and sold the old business and just focused primarily on this thing that, you know, someone pays, you know, $40 a month for and uh, never looked back three and a half years later. Yeah, it was kind of funny because in the beginning, I don't, I don't think we actually set out to be a startup. We weren't like, let's no. create a new company and, and tackle the world. It was we had an idea to change the way we were delivering training and we were getting a lot of resistance from the mm. just the the industry you know from from our, our own coworkers in some cases yeah. from from the leadership in our organization you know, we were we were franchised from a you know from a what was that a franchise franchise or <laughs> franchise or and uh, and they didn't like the direction that we were moving in so we changed right, well, let's let's just do it on the side and so that's how we became that startup and we quickly overtook the other model, but I think mostly because we were just really passionate about it. And we wanted mm -hmm. it to happen. It's a busy space. There's other people doing what we do, but we we bring uh, you know passion through personality and, yep. and all that to to create the the content we make. And I think when we first started getting into it, what we realized is I think we truly want others to have the same opportunity that we've had from learning technology and and having access to uh, the knowledge. And we wanted to remove barriers to that. And sometimes price mm. is, is a barrier because it could be 20000 or $60,000, depending on where you go, in order to get an education in IT. And if we could remove price and if we could remove maybe geography, wherever you're located, maybe there's not a good provider of training or learning. And so let's remove that barrier. And so we, uh, everything that we did kind of led to where we are today is to try to train people around the world. You know, our purpose, we established our purpose is – is um, to, uh, to empower the world. empower the world through learning. I can't believe I just <laughs> that I say it all the time. But you know, I in in the beginning it was uh, to improve improve people's lives through learning, and then we kind of had this epiphany that said, "Who are we to say people's lives need to be improved? What if we just empower people with knowledge, mm. and by empowering them, they can do make the decisions that they want in their life?" And so we remove all the obstacles. You know, price. We're at a price point that is uh, super competitive. Everyone should have access to it. Uh, the technology is there, so everyone does have access to it. And we are fortunate to have people like Don and, and other subject matter experts and guest subject matter experts that come in that bring their area of expertise and make it easy. 
It seems like a really natural pivot uh, from one business to the other, and it's a pretty major pivot because you like ended up selling the other business in favor of the new one. How did you fund the the newer online uh, training component uh, in the beginning? You know that that's kind of interesting because uh, um, whenever we first started, we were kind of running the expenses through the old business to start up the new business, mm. and it, it was about a year, year and a half as we were kind of getting our feet wet. Uh, there were some other issues that were going on that was kind of delaying stuff, you know, and some personal lives. And uh, we just kind of took cash flow from one business to the other. And then once we sold the other business, then we just bootstrapped this business because we've received no funding on this business. It's just been bootstrapping and, and operating it, you know, with a positive P&L and positive cash flow to try to continue to, in, to grow. And we've continued to make investments and in growth. Uh, we'll be at 40 employees uh, next month and wow. that's a lot of payroll and and we've been tight we've been frugal like we 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 spend money where it needs to be spent but we don't we don't take disbursements you know the yeah. money goes right back into the company our, our marketing has been a big part of the success of the company so that that's really when we have these these group meetings with all the staff and we say hey you know we we made x amount of dollars last month but that doesn't mean we're all going out and buying deloreans <laughs> or whatever it means we'll do more marketing <laughs> next month <laughs> we'll hire more people no, that's no. that's awesome. Now, uh, you folks made a, a big investment in in your studio. Um, what went into that decision? You know, as Don says, you were frugal and spent it in areas that you deemed important. What was the the driving factors behind wanting to put that investment into a, a studio? Well, I, I think first off was the facility. It was is an old uh, cellular central office. So it was a twenty eight thousand square foot facility. It was a rock solid building. We know it, it was built about twenty one years ago. And, you know, so that started out to be the facility. We were going to take about half of it. Uh, and we wanted to build these studios. And fortunately, in today's uh, expense, electronics expense, uh, it's not as expensive as it was five years ago or 10 yeah, years ago in order absolutely. to build out the studios. And the technology has gotten much, much better. We chose like the GV di director to be our uh, video switcher. Uh, so there's, that's the extreme amount of power that goes into that. So you know, while it was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars that we spent on our studios, it wasn't in the millions of dollars. So we were able to, you know, kind of take some of the cash that, that we had from the sale of the other business and make the investments in. And, you know, a little bit of debt and, you know, a little bit of equipment leases, you know, here and there to put it together to make it happen. Yeah, and the, the studio that you got to see was actually, I mean, it's really like Studio 3.0 or 4.0, our, our original studio. We still have some video footage. It is horrible like, I mean, yeah. it, was just a, it was us learning because we, we weren't av guys and and we bought this this hd camera that was amazing but had so many buttons on it none of us knew how to yeah. use it and, and we weren't smart enough to say let's hire a camera guy <laughs> we were like i can read the manual which didn't work out uh you know the figuring out the lighting and all that and, and so then Lenses. we said let's take this warehouse space that we had left over at the other building and, and convert that into a studio and, and then we started putting some more money into that and and we said we could get away with cheap stuff you know a lot of people film content right on their iphone and things but but we wanted it to be where it looked professional where it looked good and so we we took that original single studio and really tweaked and refined it over two years mm -hmm. so that when we finally were generating revenue and had enough subscription income coming in that we could move into this building and you know just do the same studio five times and really make that next jump and now you know, I, I walk through these studios and I don't see a component in here that I want to replace. There's nothing where I say, oh, I wish I could have gotten X, Y, Z. We've awesome. got what we want. And, and that, you know, that took time. It took us four years to get to this point. That's awesome. So what is the, uh, Michael, do you have questions? I don't want to. Uh, well, I mean, I, I've, I've got, I mean, I got tons of questions because I, I have a tendency to geek out on this. And like, I'm, I'm looking at your setup right now going, all right, I'm taking notes, <laughs> all the things that I want to be able to do. But, but on the business side to it, I mean, when you look at this, I, I, I love everything that you've said so far in terms about, you know, empowering people and giving them better access to it. So then how do you figure out, because you're, you're in a space that, as you pointed out, is competitive, but it's still a new space. People trying to pick up their skills. I mean, in technology, maybe it's not as new, um, but how do you then take everything you've learned with higher production quality? How often do you iterate or how, like, how are you building that audience and helping people achieve more based on those relationships that you have? How does that work? So one of the key things for us, and I'll jump in, I'll let you wrap it up, but, uh, 
um, is that we're able to produce content very fast. So uh, you know, take the security ah. world, for example, security training, it changes very, very quickly. And when you look at the, you know, some of the competition that's out there, somebody like Sans, their content is top notch. You know, they create really great content. And when you get instructor led training with them, it's amazing. You get a great experience, but you've got to schedule it. You've got to travel. They do the, the online training, but the online training, you know, it takes a little longer to, to update that kind of thing for us. If there's something new that, you know, like the, the WannaCry ransomware, I can jump in the studio and film something today and have it out there tomorrow. So we're able to produce things very, very quickly. And we do it in a, a casual conversational format. So it's not like we have to write scripts and set up teleprompters. We just get up there and talk. And so that really gets our gets our content out to market way faster uh, and gives us a bit of an edge over some of the competition where yeah, if we took six months to create a course, then we might be able to get it more polished and more precise. But if we can get it out there in one month, six months from now, the course is almost obsolete. One year from now, the course is obsolete. We need to refilm it anyway. So our library is constantly changing. And that we we kind of discovered through our piracy conversations because we, we create video content. It's very easy to pirate that content. And so we started looking at, at ways to do copy protection and DRM. And at the end of the day, we said, you know what? Screw it. We're not going to DRM this stuff. People, you know, if they're going to steal it, they're going to find a way around the DRM anyway. And our content has a shelf life that's that's fairly short. So if you're a subscriber, you constantly get the new content. If you're not a subscriber and you bootleg it, then you're getting older content. So there, there's like an incentive to subscribe. And we keep the price low, which, again, is incentive to subscribe. And I, I yeah, think in the beginning... The, the the problem that I feel that we're solving by having a startup because you always want to like solve some sort of problem is as your purpose or the reason that you exist or you want to create the new company is authorized training uh, was never done into the format that we were that we were creating. There was video training for Microsoft server or security, but it was never done like it was in the authorized world. So our DNA for 15 years is teaching those authorized Microsoft Cisco and, you know, certified ethical hacker type courses, uh, CISSP. So we take that DNA and we teach that authorized type of training, which I think we all understand and appreciate those five day courses. And we bring that to a format that tries to bring the best of instructor led experience with a host and a subject matter expert, a casual conversation as we create it and we live stream it. There's people in the chat room that are asking questions. So a lot of times when you learn, you learn from other people that are asking questions. So we bring that to a video format. And that's what I think that we've done well, because you had your Excels and your Photoshops and your photography type courses that are in video, but not as technical courses. And I think that that's what we did brought to the table. That's what's, awesome. What surprised ahead, you? Like, so, it, so as you look at it and you look at how things have changed, I mean, I, I, I've already admitted that I'm pretty impressed with the, the production quality and the stuff that you guys have put into that. I think more and more that matters. So have you found that, yeah, that like, not just for your own edification, but has that made a difference in terms of your market and your marketplace? And then what surprised you? Let's even go back last year, maybe two years, something that surprised you about delivering training this way that, you know, you've been doing it a long time. There's still surprises. What's something that popped up? I would say probably the biggest surprise is that uh, we did something that people liked. And <laughs> and mm -hmm. like, I, I remember... <laughs> <laughs> when you, every, every, every day when you create something, you see the people who subscribe, the new subscribers. And yeah. then every night you would get their credit card in a subscription business, our SaaS business. And then you're like, the next month they come back. And then there's more new people. And you're like, finally, we're going to run out of people who are going to like us. This is going to cap off. But we've been fortunate that each and every month we've had net new memberships and it continues to grow. That, I mean, that really surprises to me sometimes. The one that surprised <laughs> me, and, and we were definitely naive on this, is that we were launching an internet business, right? So it didn't really matter where our subscriber was, but we never thought outside of the United <laughs> oh, States. Yeah. And so oh, th this goes back yeah. to that. Our, our web page launched, and it was like October of 20, 2013? No, 2013, October 21st. Okay. So, 2013. so it launches, and then that first week, we get a support ticket from somebody saying, hey, I'm trying to check out, and it's asking for a state and, and I'm in Canada. We don't have states. <laughs> and, mm. and I said, wow, we, we never thought of that. Somebody's outside the U.S. <laughs> that wants to buy. <laughs> so we, we had to rush in and get a, you know, a, a web page. Our whole shopping cart had to be updated to handle international payments. And now, what, what, what percentage of our subscribers is international? It's about 30% in 170 wow. countries. I mean, that's a huge chunk of our revenue. Imagine just leaving 30% on the table. 
just by having re requiring a state when you check out. <laughs> and God, God bless the people in the UK and Australia and everywhere else. Uh, they're great fans and they support us a lot, so we're grateful. Mm -hmm. So there's a NIT That's Pro fantastic. incorporated in like the Bahamas or something to take those international payments. <laughs> <laughs> we're not that smart. <laughs> we don't have an Irish office. Yeah. The, the one person sitting at a desk in Ireland. <laughs> That's, uh, it. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That's a common track, tactic. Do you track things like uh, how often people watch either specific parts of training, how long they engage with the videos? Does that shape how you shape content? <laughs> do you look at mobile versus desktop? Do you look at like... What kind of data are you looking at to try to then level up what everybody else is able to do? I say, yes, we do track it all. We track everything. Uh, I can tell you that 35% of our viewers like to watch it in front of the TV on a Roku or Apple TV device. I was going to ask about that. What's, that. What was that wow. percentage again, Tim? 35 in front of a TV. <clears throat> That's really good. That's really good. And I yeah. mean, our, our businesses are somewhat similar uh, in strategy, uh, you know, you talked about technology, you talked about educating uh, and empowering people. Uh, you know, our economic model is, is different, um, but in the podcast world, that number is much lower. I mean, it's like 5% that watch it on the, on the TV. Um, in a lot more podcasts have videos. So being that high, that's really, that's encouraging. I think once you get into people's living rooms, um, you start to really shape the way people consume content and uh, give them a lot more and better options for consuming it. I, I think that people enjoy sitting on the couch, watching the video with a laptop in their lap, and they're able to kind of do what people are talking about. Mm -hmm. And that, that creates a, a different type of effect. On the flip side, 30% are on a mobile device, you know, a phone or, or pad, some sort of tablet. And then the, you know, PC Max in the middle. Yeah, and it's funny you ask about it because literally it was just this morning that Tim and I are in his office and we were talking about uh, one of our apps that was just having some issues, getting some kind of low ratings. And as a business, as a startup where where you're trying to be frugal, you're trying to put money where it needs to go, you have to look at those apps and say, all right, is it is it worth it for me to invest in a TVOS app, right? Because it costs a lot of money to get that developed and in the app store. And when we look at our statistics and we see the users actually using these products. I mean, for a long time, the Roku, which is super easy to develop for the Roku, mm. uh, we've always had a huge amount of viewership on that. So it's absolutely worth it for us to develop for those platforms. But we track metrics also because we we bonus our instructors on this. So when we have talent that's here, uh, you know, a subject matter expert, we want them to create the best content possible. So what we tell them is, hey, you know, you might get paid X amount of dollars to film the content, but then we pay residuals based on the viewership. And so we track every view that a video gets where somebody watches more than 50% of it. Cause you know, plenty of people start a video and say, Oh, this yeah. is lame and, and click off. You don't want to pay for that. So, uh, so we know that if we see videos that are getting a huge drop off rate, then it's probably bad and we need to go and re-record it. And we have like a little star ranking system. People can give it five stars or three stars. So if there's ever an empty day in the studio, I can just go and say, let me pull up my episodes that have one star and I'll go and refilm those because they yep. suck. So it helps us to make better content for the users. Um, I want to, so uh, have you looked into developing, and this is a totally off the rails question, but have you looked into developing for Cody and having a Cody app? You know, um, we haven't, uh, you know, we have these various app platforms that we support and, 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 one of the challenges you bump into is no matter how many platforms you support, you're going to get support tickets. People saying, hey, when when are you going to have a, a PlayStation app or a yeah. Xbox <laughs> channel and, and mm -hmm. whatever? And, and you can't you can't do them all. Right. So you've got to kind of pick and choose the ones that are, are the most suited. I think that for our subscriber base, being techie type people, a Kodi app might be appropriate. But that platform is so so rife with piracy that I, I don't know. It, it's tough for us to jump in on that one mm. uh, and, and use it. Yeah, we haven't haven't moved forward on it yet. Um, my other question is, how do you know uh, moving forward, like what content you want to produce based on your audience, right? And this is a, a classic startup problem, right? Uh, I'm solving a problem with my product. How do I know where to focus my efforts on new product development and and marketing? I think from a from a big level, I'll say big level, but because Don is the champion for everything IT, so he's the one that ultimately <laughs> makes those decisions. But from a from a high level, uh, about forty percent of our content tends to be stuff that is typically certification based, like for mm -hmm. IT, and about sixty percent is some sort of skills based. So if you've been in the in the uh, arena for five or ten years and you just want to learn how to do certain things or learn certain skills, or maybe there's some things like some PFSense firewalls and things like that, that's about sixty percent. So we have a lot of customer requests and then we track usage. 
and then we stay up to date with the latest certifications. Uh, one of our pain points in previous years was content that you might have a vendor for that uh, it's not new or it's not updated whenever content changes, is that we want to be first to market. In fact, it's one of our six core values is to create new effective content every day. So if we can be first to market, then I feel like that we'll win and people will start to see, hey, they have it first, so I want to go there, the new CEH V9. You know, they have it first, I want to go there. And that's an area where we got a lot of conflicting advice when we were starting. And if you go and you read the self-help books and startup guides, half of them will tell you, you've got to listen to your customer. Your customer will give you great feedback. And they're right. And then the other half will tell you, don't listen to your customer because they don't know what they want, right? Like the, the Steve Jobs where he said, if I listened to the customer, we wouldn't have had an iPhone. Mm -hmm. and, and so what we found is that we kind of hedge our bets on both. And so we have a course request list where people submit things and, and you know they, they vote on, on what they want. And so we try and create courses around that about half the time. And then the other half of the time, we create content in the areas that we think there's a need for. And by doing that, we meet the customer's needs the way they want it. We meet what we think the market needs are. And because we're pretty agile as a company, if something's not working out, we can always move away from it. Yeah. So like our, our Mac library, I had initially planned to grow our Mac OS training this year and start adding more courses. And we decided to scale that back because Apple's not quite investing in that platform, uh, in the Mac OS platform like they were before. So it doesn't make sense for us to continue to create a depth of content. Instead, we'll increase our Linux content. And, and that's you know just responding to the market needs. And things that we pick up at RSA or Infocom or, you know, talking to you, Paul, and, and your people, you know, what's the latest in the market? And we try to keep it close to the heartbeat and try to bring that information back to our members. Yeah. And that was my I, other question. How, how do you get the subject matter experts? <laughs> hmm. uh, that's a trickier one, right? Because um, that's the number one challenge. Our, our product at the end of the day is the subject matter expert in front of the camera. And right? good ones. And, and finding, a, finding a, a person who's really knowledgeable in security and can talk <laughs> is, you know, if people skills are not like number one on the IT resume. So we've been fortunate to have encountered people over the years that fit that role, that, that are able to get in there and do it. And we've had some uh, that haven't. Yeah, yeah, sometimes it doesn't work out, but we always try and meet new people, um, book authors, which rarely work out, but occasionally do. Uh, we meet people at trade shows and conferences. We we just meet people through industry connections, you know, people, uh, you know, like, like meeting you, Paul, and, and then you know a network of people. And so while, um, you know, you might be terrible on camera, you might know people who aren't, right? It's true. <laughs> I am pretty terrible on camera. <laughs> <laughs> but you got an opportunity. Well, so you know, I, I'm, I, I love, I, this has been an opportunity for me to learn a lot about the way that you guys do things. And I've really appreciated it because, you know, one of the things Paul and I've been talking about for people for the last year is you need to iterate quickly. So when you say, look, you've got a goal, putting out new content quick, scrap the stuff that doesn't work, building the stuff that works great. I really dig it. When we then look at startups, when you look at the catalog, recognizing it's changing and it's shifting, what are some of the courses that people listening to this right now that are maybe uh, maybe they're full-time employed and they're kind of thinking startup on the side or they're, they're curious in a startup? We keep seeing these headlines. If you want to be in a startup today, you have to have a certain level of tech literacy. What are some things that kind of pop out to you right now as, oh, if I was in a startup, I would totally take this course because these are some of the areas you want to be comfortable in, if not fluent in? I think that if you're if you're building a security startup, every one of your employees, even even the ones that are answering the phone, should have gone through at least Security Plus training, right? CompTIA Security Plus. It's not going to teach you how to pen test a server. It's not going to teach you how to be the world's greatest hacker, but it's going to teach you the security jargon and the terms and the fundamentals mm. and theory that you need to be aware of. And and even even the support desk person that's answering your phone needs to be aware of that. You know, one so that they don't get fished or socially engineered. But mm -hmm. two, when they're talking with your customer, they they sound like somebody other than a, a phone operator reading a script. You know, they can actually at least talk <laughs> the language. I think that's really important. Um, I, I, I'm i going to go more to the, like the business side. I can tell you what audio books I might, you know, tell someone to listen to or, or books to read uh, as that's different than what content that we might create. Mm -hmm. Some of the uh, new subscriptions that we're going to launch this summer uh, is a business professional library, which will have some entrepreneurship, leadership type content. So I would oh, be fantastic. looking for that, you know, end of the year. Oh, that's yeah, exciting. And, you know, Tim, you, uh, there's a saying we throw around. You didn't come up with it. I, I can't remember who coined it, where they said, like, uh, I might be the CEO the company needs today, but I'm not the CEO the company needs six months from now. Right. So I, I have to be the CEO a year and two years from now that the company needs me to be. So I have to continue to invest in learning myself the same way that you do in technology. Yeah. 
and it's almost easier for me because I, I can see the technology changing and I, I know what I need to stay up on versus in the business world, it's a changing market that's very hard to anticipate, but you've got to constantly be learning. Yeah. Um, another saying we stole from somebody was that a good IT person is always learning. Good right? IT pro is always learning. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's that's kind of the, the, the nutshell of it. And so as a, uh, if you're going to run a startup, I, I would say first off, um, don't be afraid to bring in consultants. Don't be afraid to bring in auditors to people people who do know more than you. You need to recognize when there's something that you don't know, and don't don't pretend like you can just read an mm -hmm. article on the internet and know it. Like sometimes you need help. Fantastic. No, I I think that's a great point. You know, I like. I just want to echo too. One of my very first conversations, 21, 22 years ago, was I, I had a guy that was older. He sat me down. He said, Michael, let me tell you something right now. Everything you think you're learning right now is going to change. If you learn one thing, just keep learning. If if mm -hmm. you can keep learning, you will set yourself apart in this career forever. By the way, he knew COBOL. I think he could probably still get a job today. <laughs> but, you know, like if we look at it, you know, categorically, though, um, that's really exciting. I, I'm personally kind of – I'm really curious to see where you guys go with the leadership side uh, and the business side of things, the business acumen. I, I know a lot of our listeners – you know, when we're looking at innovation in the business of security, I, man, there's so much there that I'm I'm fired up about. So I'll look forward to that uh, that update when you guys are ready for it. But it's gonna be cool nice. Stuff. We're already starting to release some of the content um, in the IT Pro TV library. Uh, we're launching the Biz Pro TV, Office Pro, which is like end users end user um, office, not just Microsoft Office, but the Office Worker. But it has a, a a slant towards security, and it's in the end users language. So sometimes that end user office worker doesn't speak the same language as the help desk or security person. So we're we're putting it into like the things that my mom can understand with security and why you don't put a USB that you found in the parking lot into your computer at the office. <laughs> uh, it's Creative Suite and uh, Dev Dev Pro. We're doing some developer courses, and what we have done now is still create uh, available on the IT Pro subscription library. Just farther down, it shows as beta, but we'll launch those fourth quarter this year. Exciting stuff. That's awesome. Well, thank you much. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for uh, giving us the update uh, and sharing uh, your story uh, in the the startup world and, and with our audience. Uh, I'm excited about the things you guys have coming up. So, thanks again for coming on Startup Security Weekly. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. With that, we can take a short break. Come back and talk about our startup articles and discussion coming up next.